four types of Windows updating. And this is based on uh, an article from the Ask Woody Plus newsletter from Fred Langa. And he's one of their contributors. This is paid content, so I'm uh, deviating on quite a bit from what he said, uh, not just to avoid uh, using paid content, but also to make sure that I, we cover things in the order in which I want to with adequate emphasis on what I'm emphasizing. Uh, it's more likely I'll see questions if they're in the chat feed uh, or Steve will see them. Someone can monitor chat. And uh, I'll try to see whether I can get through the demo before we get deeply into the questions and comments because that tends to get things sidetracked. I, so here's what the problem is. I, a reader, one of Fred's readers says, Windows Programs and Features is listing 183 programs installed on my PC. But another updater called Patch My PC reports that 39 applications are up to date and some all, which I'm going to demonstrate, lists 467 products loaded of which 71 require a major update. I, just a moment. There, a major update. I, when he looks at these 71 apps, the vast majority are listed as Adobe, Corel, or Oracle. And here's what I, I will go into a little more detail as to how these bits and pieces I end up being listed separately. But the point is that the bits and pieces are going to turn out to be parts of just a few programs. So things aren't really quite as complicated as they may at first look. I, Fred then goes on to say there's actually four different kinds of Windows software. You have the Windows operating system updates, which are pretty much automatic for most of us. I, but there are some questions about when and, what, I, when and how to get a feature update, such as the current May update for I, getting version 2004, as Microsoft is calling it. And there is a problem with the 2004 uh, user controls over updates. Uh, it applies more to people who have been using Pro and have been deferring feature updates than other people. It turns out I got a Microsoft update and I'm still on 1909, and I lost some of these Pro features too from the user interface. So anyway, there are also program and system and subsystem components. These are drivers, driver-related software, firmware, or BIOS software. I, firmware and BIOS is a little between software and hardware, and most people under most conditions will not want to be fussing with that. There are also vendor, integrator, and update tools which may be supplied by your PC maker. I, uh, and there, finally, there are applications that make the computer actually do something, and that's application software. Application software is what we'll be focusing on because that's the hardest to keep track of. I mean, say I've got 41 applications, how do I know which one needs an update? So, uh, again, I have already talked about the Windows update and the deferral options would be a different topic for a different time. I, however, you do sometimes need to update your Windows Store apps. I, recently, there has been what is known as a zero day that has to do with codecs, which is how Windows handles coding and decoding of video and images. And it turns out that in order to get this thing, which is a security related update, you actually have to update your Windows Store apps. And that is done by, I, normally the Store apps will update automatically for most people, but you might wanna make sure that you actually manually click on that Windows Store icon. It's either going to be on your task bar or else it's going to be on the alternative start menu that you get by hitting that Windows logo. And you wanna make sure those apps are updated. So I do have a little reference for that. Now, I, the vendor and integrator tools are kind of an interesting category. What we're talking about here is 
I, HP has something called a support assistant. And so there's pre-installed software and there's drivers and driver related software, and it's all collected together into one updater. I, I have something like that on my system that has to do with drivers. And what I would like to do is briefly fire up what I have. And in order to do that, let me see if I can move you guys around. Okay, now what I wanna do is, I'm gonna to have to use my search in order to get to it. I, mine's an Intel machine and here it is, the driver and support assistant. I'm going to see whether this thing is going to run. Yes, and it scans for a little while and then it shows what on my system is, uh, it gives a report of the versions of everything. And if there's an update, it will show available updates. And on some, on many PCs, you will find that this will not only list your drivers, but it will also list all kinds of pre-installed software. And so getting back to my slide. So uh, there are things like that. I used to have a Toshiba laptop, which had, uh, which had uh, a whole bunch of utilities. It included something that uh, showed the activities I had recently engaged in. Toshiba called it real time, R-E-E-L. I, it's very similar to what Microsoft picked up in Windows 10 as their, uh, let me see what it calls itself, their task view history. And the task view history shows up like a film reel next to your uh, search magnifying glass on your task bar. And if you ever click on that, if you have it active, I, it will show your recent activities until you clear it. So I, Asus I also has had a utility like that. One thing I do want to say about drivers is that some devices like my Asus tablet and some laptops have something called a system on a chip and you would need to update the entire package of SOC drivers all at once. You can't update the components individually or you'll run into some serious problems. That's another reason not to update individual drivers. Uh, so again, some people don't like the OEM tools. Uh, they may have phone home or logging activity like the Toshiba real time. <clears throat> if you could see your activities on your computer, Toshiba could upload those activities and store them and make some kind of use of them. I, you, you also could end up having a lot of storage space taken up by OEM software. And this is why a whole cottage industry of things like PC decrapifier has grown up. I, some OEM software will conflict with Windows features or slow down system performance. And the OEM utilities and software may eventually expire, leaving you with no further update options for them. So uh, some people prefer a clean version of Windows 10 to keep it nice and simple. I, so again, the drivers should be those that are best suited to your overall hardware environment. Updating individual component drivers can do more harm than good. Your system vendor is usually the best source for driver updates. Next best is the component manufacturer. And I would stay away from third-party driver update utilities for reasons that I am going to quote from Fred Langa about software updating. And we already saw my driver and support, assist, uh, support assistant, and we looked at how it operated. And why a newer driver is not always better. Existing hardware usually does not benefit from newer features in the new drivers. Newer drivers may not even work with the older hardware. And if that happens with your video, you're gonna have a black screen. That's not easy to deal with. I, the one exception is there might be a serious security flaw. NVIDIA had a couple of those a few years ago and you really did need an update. 
Microsoft even sent some of these updates through Microsoft Update, but I would generally avoid getting drivers from Microsoft. And when Windows substitutes one of its own drivers, I go back to the Intel driver assistant and reinstall the manufacturer package. So the best ad advice on drivers is, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Bob, would you, uh, would you, would you uh, replace the Microsoft driver, the Windows driver, uh, with the vendor driver, as opposed to the, uh, the that is, if you're on a Dell or a uh, HP or an Asus, with the driver provided by them, as opposed to the, uh, the hardware driver the, from, the, from the hardware vendor? If it is anything other than graphics or sound, I would generally not go with the component. You remember I said SOC is a problem sometimes. Sometimes the entire hardware package is custom made. In fact, most manufacturers do that. With Intel, I have just genuine Intel for almost everything except my Realtek sound. But that all comes from a common source from my equipment vendor. So yes, there are cases where you'll do the individual component for an add-on graphics card, for example. But just to clarify, the drivers from the equipment vendor, that is the, the people who own your, your computer, yeah. generally are tested on the computer that you have and therefore probably work better than just a generic driver or a driver from the hardware manufacturer for the component. Yeah. Yes, they tend to be more uh, tuned to the overall hardware environment. Whereas if you get one from a third party uh, utility, or one directly from the component manufacturer, you'll often see a warning. This is a generic driver for this hardware component. And that means it's not tuned to your system. And I have had compatibility issues on occasions. I used to use a driver update utility called Driver Max. And I, I'm gonna get to uh, why dot versions aren't always something you want. I, the other thing I just want to touch on is firmware because there's been so much talk about Spectre and Meltdown and how Intel firmware and BIOS has to be updated and they had frequent updates. Turned out there were no threats that most users would be subject to that were in the wild. And every time you do a BIOS flash, it's tricky. You can have issues with system performance and more serious hardware malfunctions. So it's not a good thing. However, I can tell you from my experience, my BIOS on my Intel Nook little computer does not shut down correctly. I, uh, about every second or third time that it tries to shut down under unknown specific conditions, it'll do a restart instead of a shutdown. And it happens both in Windows and Linux, so I know that it's gotta be a BIOS issue. I don't know how that happened, but that's the Skylake series of processors for you. They had some microcode flaws. Okay, so now we're getting to the core of what we're doing here, and it's application software. We all have this kind of software, and it comes from different vendors. And I, so how do we keep track of what truly needs updating? So let's take a look at SOMO. SOMO, you can see it now, folks, right? SOMO, yeah. okay, good, good. Uh, SOMO is a multi-vendor tracker. It just tracks from just about, I think it's somewhere between 2,000 and 10,000 titles that these guys track. And I, they look for any available update. Now, any available update can mean a lot of different things. Let's take what I'm highlighting now, Malwarebytes. And it shows that I have an installed version and I have an update available. You'll notice there's a decimal point and then another decimal point and then you get to what the update is. If this were non-security software, I might ignore that because maybe I don't wanna take the risk that the new features are going to change something or break something. Maybe I don't need the new features. And if there isn't any security reason to get them, maybe I wouldn't do it. I am going to show you some, an option 
in SUMO. Now this is the free version I have. There is a paid version which will download and I don't know if it actually installs, but it will download the update from either the database maintained by SUMO or from the vendor site. And that way you would be doing similar to what Ninite would do where it will just download and install your updates. Uh, Ninite can be set to do it automatically. Some oh, you do it yourself. And we have some settings. In the center panel of the settings, we have under display, there is the option to show the file path. By default, that's not on. Why do I want this? It's because in the file path column, I see program files, malware bytes, and that's the main folder that it's in. Then I see where it was detected, which is one of the subfolders down to the actual executable. Let me scroll down to something that would not be familiar to the average person. Viboot from Paramount Software UK. Does anybody know what Viboot is without uh, being told? It is over on Path. It is under Program Files, Macrium, Reflect. That's the only way I would know that that is a component of Macrium Reflect. If you get Adobe products or Corel products or Oracle, I don't know if this is true of Microsoft Office, but if you got these products, you might get several listings of bits and pieces of them that don't bear the name Adobe or the name Corel or something of that nature. And that is why it's good to have a guide like the file path. Now, if I were to select get update, I don't want to do get update from or anything like that because then they'll prompt me to upgrade to their paid product. But I can get an update. And if I'm not sharing my browser, let me make sure I am. This is the screen that you will see. And it will offer Google. It will offer Major Geeks, which is one of my favorite third party software download places for free software. And then you can Google. Macrium software, which is where you would get this Viboot. And if you open the link, you would get a description from the vendor of you would have Macrium Reflect 7. And it will say integrated Viboot 2 and various other things about it. And if you wanted to know what Viboot was, you could, this is one of my browser extensions being an idiot. I, that's one of the problems with browser extensions. But anyway, Macrium Viboot then tells you what it is and what it does. And you will know from this description that it's something you probably want to update if you're using it when there is an update available. And you update it by updating the whole Macrium Reflect, the whole Macrium Reflect program. So the nice thing about Macrium Reflect and also about paint.net and a few others is that, let me restore my share to KC, some old. Uh, the nice thing about uh, Macrium Reflect, paint.net and a few other programs is that from within the program, you can actually check for updates and it will update without taking you outside of the program, without downloading a special installer and without all that other stuff. So it keeps it much simpler. And like John, I like to keep things as simple as possible. I, so what I want to do at this point is, I, I want to fire up one of my programs that does have an internal updater just to show how this might work in some cases, although I won't have an update. But I, uh, that's not gonna want me to do it. Let, let me do it with something that won't go into administrator mode. Okay, I'm going to do a new share and it is going to be 
uh, paint.net. Okay, now I'm sharing my paint.net screen. And this is where I am going to take a little time to figure out where it's update. Uh, well, anyway, there is a spot in the program where you check for updates. Here it is, updates. And I can check now, and it is checking. Currently, there are no available updates, but if there were one, it would just show a little box that says download the update if you want it. And then it would show it would immediately go to an installer type of a screen, a little box, and it would close the program, and the installation would go through just the way any kind of MSI or EXE installer would do. And it all operates entirely within the program, so you don't need to download anything special. Unfortunately, most programs aren't that nice, and you do have to, I'm not saving a blank image, I uh, just a moment while I get here and I'll get to your chat stuff in a few minutes. Okay, so I'm sharing some O again. And so that's how we do that. I want to do a new share and get back to my slides. So we're doing this. I Start from the current slide. All right, I've shown what Samo does and how it does it, basically, and how I use its information. I use it as a guide, not as an automatic updater. I, I also, whoops, stay here. I also use the option to show the path. Now, there is a possibility there is software listed that's actually driver related. And that's a special case with some old. Because even though I have it set up so that it will not automatically show me drivers as such, there is an item here which shows up as having a minor update and it's called Intel ProSet Adapter Configuration Utility. Now, if I take a look at its path, I see that it's in Intel Wired Networking ProSet ACU and the ACU ProSet. Turns out for my ProSet hardware, and this is Ethernet, by the way, it's an Ethernet, uh, it's really not driver, it's the control software for that driver. And the problem with that one is it doesn't have an update for my hardware. And if I look at my Intel driver update assistant, it won't show that there's any available update. So between 25.0 and 25.1, I know what happened. There was an issue in some versions of this, some releases of it, where the language was wrong if you had the Dutch language it would show in the wrong language or Portuguese. I think they had Portuguese and Dutch mixed up. I don't use either of those languages, so I don't need this update. So I'm okay with it. I could even tell Samo if I wanted to uh, ignore it, but I'm not going to tell it to ignore it because I wanna know that it's there. But most people could just let it ignore and then all you would see is that this malware bytes, I, I would download that at some point at my leisure and update it. I, now let's see one last thing before I go to some questions. The biggest problem with software updating utilities is their reliance on build numbers as a sign of needs updating. For example, if you're running and you've got all this stuff all the way to the right of the decimal dot six and there's a dot seven available, it's very, unlikely that this update is going to do anything meaningful for you. In fact, replacing a smoothly functioning app for no reason other than a trivial bump in the version number, uh, runs the risk of doing more harm than good. 
so you have to be uh, so you can afford to be selective and with this update utility you will know how to be selective you will know what is available and that's the whole idea knowing what is available for the overall picture to me it keeps it much simpler than having to check every piece of software and then inevitably I'll miss one or forget one or I haven't used one in a while I uh, John Rudy raised a question what if I don't even recognize something that's up there and I don't even remember installing it? Now, I don't have anything like that, but suppose that I, for example, don't know what I, let's see, here's one. I suppose I don't know what Homedale is and I don't remember having installed it. Personally, I do know what it is, but I then, I would go out onto the internet and check and see what is it? Where does it come from? Google is probably your best friend here and see whether there are reviews of it. See whether it's vendor specific because sometimes vendors rebrand and rename stuff that has other names or is a limited version of something else. Uh, Acronis, for example, their backup program is often uh, put onto hard drives that are made by manufacturers and they brand it and call it something else. But it's really a Cronus, a limited version. And then you have to decide, do I want to actually upgrade to the paid version or the full version? Oftentimes, if the utility is useful, I will want to do that. Uh, other times, maybe not so much. Maybe I prefer the limited version. But remember, a limited version can go out of support and it can get to the point where you can no longer update it and you can no longer use it. Okay, so uh, I've talked quite a bit about this stuff. Let us see if we have some interesting chat going on here. Uh, okay, is there a parallel system to help with Macintosh computers? Harry Fostick asks this. I, I would have to defer to Steve about this, Steve Eisenberg. You use a lot of Mac. I, is there an overall updater that has a Mac version? I think maybe even some old does have a Mac version. But uh, Steve, do you know anything with, with Mac that uh, will take an inventory of what's on your Mac and tell you whether or not there's an update? The way I do that is I use the uh, intrinsic software in uh, the uh, what is it called the um, app store because when I run app store it looks at all the applications and, and tells which ones have the uh, latest updates and uh, no it doesn't it tells you which ones need to be updated okay so Apple relies a lot on its app store and Microsoft yeah, also has an application if you have an application that you didn't load in by the app store then you're on your own as I far see. As I know, there might be a solution I haven't found it Okay. Bob also, Bob, also, Apple is a closed system, as I put in the chat. Apple is a closed system. Windows is an open system, and therefore relying on, I call it the iTunes store in the chat, but the App Store is the right name. I couldn't, I couldn't remember the right name. Uh, yeah. But the, relying on the App Store is probably the best place to know you're getting the right software. If there's an update included in the App Store, it means it's been vetted by Apple. They've injected their appropriate pieces of software to scrape your machine of all your personal information, and you can go ahead and install it. There was a joke there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I get you, uh, and uh, quite amusing. I uh, yes, the Apple App Store uh, I this. does tend to be. Here it is. Steve is showing it to us, and uh, it's a very nice way of doing things. If you don't mind the vendor tie-in and everything like that. Microsoft has its own store apps also, and they would probably prefer we use them. Uh, do you need to worry as much about Microsoft store apps, Mitch Wolf asks? Yes, we just had a situation that I mentioned at the top of my talk where I, there is currently a zero day attack involving codecs, video codecs, and I, the only way you can protect yourself is to go to your Windows Store icon, wherever you may find it, and click on it. And you may need to log in with your Microsoft account ID if you're running from a local account. And then 
seek updates to your store apps. Normally this happens automatically, but in this case, since it's something really recent, you might want to force it by doing it manually. I, I don't have a, uh, a Microsoft account on, on one of the boxes because I just upgraded and so on and so forth. I've never gone to their store. I, I keep it as vanilla as possible and I'm not running the professional edition. I mean, I, but you tell me that, that I still may have to worry about it, this, this particular problem. They, they won't automatically take care of it. Yes, Mitch. There are some apps that are built in to Windows 10. They're baked in. Uh, you would have a hard time removing them and it's not recommended that you do. Uh, the Microsoft Store uh, framework, just like Internet Explorer, is integrated, it was integrated into the operating system. Uh, the Microsoft Store is integrated into the operating system. And some things are controlled from apps which behave as store apps, even though you may not have gotten them from the store. Some features are actually that way now. Mm -hmm. And they're Mitch, kind of moving toward that. Mitch, Man. on my system, I, I do two things. I have, Win I have, I have Windows Pro, but I do uh, uh, Windows Update, let that happen automatically. And, I, and I've always, oh, I've said it in this group before, I don't mind being on the bleeding edge of updates. So I let the Windows updates happen and when I see them, I do the updates. I happen to have a Dell machine and uh, Dell support is another utility that they have. And I don't know how invasive it is, but it's there. It tells me when I need a, a, an update and that includes BIOS updates and they're all done automatically and seamlessly. And the only other, other updates that I, that I do is if I'm in an application and I saw a Bob has Caliber and I have Caliber and lots of people uh, who read eBooks use Caliber and uh, virtually weekly there's an update to Caliber. And when, it, when you, the uh, application checks itself, it checks for updates whenever it, it's launched. It says there's an update, I update it, life goes on and that's the way I work. If the application says it needs to be updated, that's coming from the vendor. They know what's going on. They know what has to be pushed as opposed to some third party, which I, which I strongly disagree with in terms of, uh, of using. I, agree, I should say I agree with Bob in not using. Uh, I don't use third parties. I always go back to the original vendor or the publisher of the software and get the software from them. It may not be tested completely in your environment. That's a virtual impossibility, but there's a very good chance that other users have, have tested it and your environment will be uh, okay unless you have some really strange and obtuse software running a, a totally custom configuration that you know, you're, you're one off in the universe, you're probably gonna be okay in most, most software that we have. Taking a quick scan of Bob's stuff that he has on his machine, there's a lot of software in there that most of us probably do not have on our machines. Yeah, I have specialized utilities and uh, there is software I use re relatively infrequently. So I never open it. So I never see that it wants to update. That's another reason for having an aggregate update notifier. Uh, remember, I'm using this to notify. I am not using this to download. I'm not using this to install. I, the only thing I would download and install en masse would be the Microsoft Store. Now, I run as vanilla as possible. There are things like browsers and tax software that automatically take care of themselves. And, uh, you know, it's good to have an audit to tell you what, what could be out of kilter. Dell does send stuff down, but they also have stuff that never finishes. And then they have reliability issues on, on some of the hardware by plugging a monitor. And it, I haven't found any place that even fixes that. I'm not going to try everything under the sun to see if it even helps with the power management and so on and so forth. So I just... Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are things, uh, there are things that go out of date. Dell stuff, Mitch. I... I I've had the Dell support assistant uh, just do its thing. I just, it, it pops up here and I'm, I'm running Windows 10, the latest version, and it pops up and it says, uh, there's some software to be downloaded. And they say, okay, it does it. It restarts the machine automatically. You know, I walk away, restart the machine and I come back and life has been good. I haven't been burned. Maybe I'm just lucky, but yeah. I, I, you know, I don't update stuff unless I'm using it. You know, as like Bob says, if there's something I haven't used in a million years, you know, if it's that old, I may even get just get rid of it from the machine. But if I don't, if I don't use it, I don't worry about it. Yeah, no, I, some of the, my Dell boxes are older, so they probably don't have that many updates anyway. 
it may be more of a problem with newer stuff that's not fully debugged and has more features. I think yeah, the biggest problem that most of us have is when you look at the list of, of things that are out there, you don't recognize half of them. Yeah. Dr. Google is your friend. Well, it is in a sense. I mean, it, it, it says, you know, this is a something within some product that does whatever, but you don't know how it got there. You don't remember installing it. Maybe you didn't install it. Maybe it, maybe it came with some other product. So removing something that you're unsure of could be a risky thing to do. And sometimes you worry that there's a virus there that your virus checker didn't take care of properly. You know, that's the thing that I have that I would really want in an audit to find, you know, for stuff that doesn't belong. I mean, it's, it's uh, to tell if it's potentially been infected or it's wrong. Uh, if I'm you're talking that, that hasn't happened. If you're talking about stuff that can get on your machine that's designed to be like adware or uh, potentially unwanted software, uh, this is why I use Malwarebytes and also Adware Cleaner, which is part of the Malwarebytes family. Uh, it, Adware Cleaner does a quick scan, and if it finds anything that's like that, it'll let, it'll let you know, and you can get rid of it. However, it will also notify you of things like uh, my printer software. It says is uh, pre-installed software, but I want that. I want to keep that, so I have to be aware of that. So I poke around with, with a task manager, and I look at what's running and what DLLs are loaded, and I yep. just manually try to figure out that doesn't look, I see the file path on it, and say, is this suspicious? Is, how long is this thing being around? Does Microsoft even use it? So yep. I, that's how I do my inspection. I don't even use third party. I just use uh, the built-in stuff in many cases. I, I do have some antivirus that's running too that catches some of the stuff that downloads. But uh, yep. I, I just like to, you know, when I, it used to be a lot cleaner when there were a lot fewer features to know what's there on fast yep. startup. And, and uh, yeah, I, so, there's so much clutter that uh, and some of it may not and a lot of it isn't terribly useful for you or, you know, and, and can be potentially problematic. And that's yeah. the stuff that you don't necessarily know about. It's it, Yeah, with, uh, by the way, getting back to John's question about unfamiliar software, there are legitimate places that review software all the time, uh, like PC Magazine, PC World, and uh, it's not hard to find reviews of stuff that you might want on your computer. If you're not finding reviews in legitimate tech publications, I'd be very suspicious that whatever you've got is either rebranded and it's really something else, or it is something you might not want. Yeah, they're, eventually they're, they're supposed to be sandboxing that's going to go more into uh, Windows. And if we use it effectively, we could just spin up new uh, VMs and, and just use them and throw them away. And that's what some of the commercial users do. Big banks and so on tend to, yep. some of them rebuild every application daily. So they get the latest update on, on, on the, uh, the base software, they install everything, and the next day it's gone. So there's no residual crap that, that's sitting around. And that's almost the, like a, a, one of the safer models that, that they're using in the industry. But you don't have the, most of us don't have that opportunity of multiple VMs that are uh, available to us to spin up and test and do whatever we want to yeah, do. Yeah, unless you're using remote software, it's, it's probably tough or if you're not doing it all the time. But it may become more and more standard. I, mean, I think Microsoft is, is, is trying to enable more sandbox techniques. And it's a way to contain a lot of uh, software, even legitimate software you may want to contain and make sure it doesn't go outside what it's supposed to do. Yeah, to, with, with all due respect, Mitch, I think if we look on this screen and if we ask the number of people who understand even how to start with a sandbox, we have a vast minority of the people that yeah, point taken. I, I just say, you know, if I have just a, oh, an down. machine that's okay. safe that we can throw out every day, I mean, it, it would solve a lot of potential issues. Yeah, and, and that's exactly why, you know, the, the big guys do that, is they don't know what's going on, and they'll sandbox and, and they'll do stuff. And, and we, in a virtual world with uh, things in the cloud, you can build hourly. And I know some companies that do that. They constantly build as, as, as you know, they, they do... Uh, uh, incremental development and as a single feature is built into the app they test it thoroughly and they sandbox it and then they release it you know and that happens hourly every six hours whatever it is and it goes up on the on, on the uh, in the cloud and it's out there and they move on that becomes the new release and you know well, that you can do that in, in rapid development 
No, I mean, they do a lot of stuff. They, they send out uh, subsets of it and have it tested by a subset of the user base before they roll it out to everybody else, for example, which you can do with, with the fancier cloud management systems. But I, yeah. I, you know, I'm, just, I'm just worried about crap that, that's uh, getting back to a baseline that, that's vanilla, just doing, using it for the day, throwing it out at the end, other than the stuff I want to persist someplace else. And then, you know, I don't do it. And, and maybe if you're really concerned about security and, and you have a lot of high-end stuff, you may do that. But it may become more of a standard thing if, if we really get hit by some bad viruses besides COVID. I'd like to um, share another application that's similar to the uh, sum O that uh, Bob just showed. And it's called uh, Ninite. Now this is a free software. I, I see that Bob is nodding. This is free software that lets you uh, pick which applications you want to be using and it will automatically load them on your machine for you. Or, no, hold on a second. Let you choose which ones you want. It will come up with a program that you can run on your Windows machine that will load these for you. For instance, if you want to have a Chrome, a Firefox, and Opera on your machine, uh, you want to have LibreOffice, uh, suppose you want to have uh, Zoom um, and uh, iTunes, and you can choose whichever ones you want. You then slide down and you get your Ninite, which is a, a program that you can run on your machine that will update these things for you automatically. Is uh, Ninite free or is it a charged item? It's both, but for our intents and purposes, it's free. There is a pro version that's used on uh, multiple machines. If you're only dealing on a machine by machine basis, it's free. So you would decide which applications you want. You would get your Ninite, which won't help me, I'm on a Mac machine here, but it will be a program that you can run on your Windows machine and uh, install your programs for you. So if you already have that program and you go to install it, will it just install the update? Yes. Um, install apps. Then this sounds easier than Sumo, because with Sumo, after you find that there's something you want to get, you have to go to uh, possibly a fair amount of effort to get the update, because Bob and I played with that last week. Yeah, that's the in the free version. You can pay for a pro version, and in the paid version, it will download from the vendor's site or from the Sumo uh, hosting site, and that would be more automatic. But that's why I asked about the free version of Ninite, because if that does the updating free of charge, um, unless there's, there's some downside to it, that sounds like a good deal. Ninite tends to support fewer programs and fewer which you have to pay for. The, the so, list is not exhaustive, as you could, could see. But I'll so, get too exhaustive if I try to do everything. Yeah. I, so Ninite might be a great place to start, but occasionally you might want to check and see if there's additional stuff that someone shows. Somebody asked about what is a sandbox. A, a sandbox is, suppose you want to make it, you want to build a building. Well, what you're going to want to do is before you start buying everything, you might go into the sandbox your kid has in the backyard, wet the sand, and make a building and see if you like the way it looks. It's a place where you can try something out, and if it doesn't work, it's not a big deal. You haven't spent any money or caused any major resources on it. In the technical field, you might have a computer that you have Windows on, and you want to try a new application. Well, maybe it's a virtual machine that you can reset, or it's a machine that you can reboot. And you can install the software on it, try it out, and decide if you want to keep, keep it keep it, or to see if it works the way you want to. Is that a good representation of what a sandbox is? Yeah, it's, it's a standalone test environment that you can really, you know, if it totally destroys your life, you have no harm to what's going on. Yeah, you just throw it away yeah. and, move, and move forward. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like I said, you can use the sandbox a day so that you, you have a start, an own starting point and more control of what goes into it. And then Sometimes, you, you throw it away at the end of the day. What, what I used to do when I was working, uh, would I, I would have a virtual machine and 
uh, I would have a snapshot and every day I could revert to that yeah. snapshot. Which, what that means is that I have a set version uh, appearance of the system and anytime I make changes, I ignore them by loading that set version over and over again. Like yeah, with the cloud environments now, you can do that very easily in most environments. You just, does, you know, uh, Amazon has stuff you can just launch and, and build in, in like less than 15, 20 minutes. You can have a virtual Windows machine with the latest, the latest base version of Windows on it and then load anything up there and, and see what flies and, and see what's going on. And when you're done with it, it gets destroyed and, you know, gets, you know, ashes to ashes, if you will. Well, it's like milk bottles that used to get delivered. You just drink the milk and then throw it out the next day. Yep. No harm done, you, you, you know, and the next, you know, if you want another milk bottle, they'll deliver one. It's all additive, too. You're not taking any off or modifying much. Just, uh, just one opinion, my personal opinion, and, and this is just me. Uh, both what, uh, what Bob and Steve showed with the two utilities, they're interesting, but I wonder if they're not overly complex for most people. You know, you, you have to go through there. There's a lot of picking and choosing. You have to have some, some underlying knowledge of what's going on. You know, for, for most people who are not terribly tech savvy, and know what all these things are, I think, in, in my opinion, they're going to be confused. I and mean, you, you put uh, Sumo or, or Nine Night on, on somebody's machine, in, in most people's machine, they're going to look at it and say, okay, now what? And it's not going to really make a lot of sense to them. And if you just <laughs> let things flow, and this is my personal preference, yeah. so you know, yell at me for being, you know, being a Luddite, but my personal preference is, you know, just leave things alone. You know, let, let, let things be. If something's broken, fix it. If it ain't broke, even though you have something from six years ago, it works. Thank you very much. Move on. Generally true, unless it turns out that there's some security reason why the software was updated or well, some then, compatibility well, reason. My point, Bob, it's broken. Yeah, but you won't see a security feature that's broken. You'll you only know, know about it. <laughs> you no, won't you'll know. Be, you'll be, you'll you won't be know that it's broken. Right. And if you, and well, if that's, you that's why you have a good friend or a, a, a six-year-old kid uh, who can help you uh, keep your machine up to date. Exactly. Or exactly. you can, or you can limit how much third-party software you put on your machine. Most people probably would be better off if they kept the amount of third-party titles to a minimum. That makes all this updating a whole lot less confusing. And that Amen. which can automatically update itself every time you open it, great. You know, you don't need every version of a, uh, of a, uh, a, a photo editing program that was ever invented on your machine just because you used it once and liked it. That's what the Microsoft Store is for. <laughs> the only thing to keep in mind is that when there are uh, security bugs in a piece of software, vendors may put out a new version, not because it adds any functionality, but because it closes the uh, security problem. So when you don't update product, you sometimes leave holes in your system. So putting yeah. on my paranoia hat, John, what, what kind of security update in an application are you worried about that's going to harm you if you don't update? I guess I don't I haven't know, found one yet. I don't know enough to answer that question. I know that when there was a lot of discussion about uh, Microsoft and whether or not one should go to newer versions of the operating system, the the complaint or, or Java, I guess that was one where where they would tell you to always update it because people were finding finding problems with it. They're still finding I, I, don't, I don't know enough to really answer it, which is why I came to the conclusion it's best to update everything. Flash See, player I, was I an think, example. I think the best defense is a, is a good offense. If you maintain a, 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 a virus protection software on your computer, and I use Windows Defender, and that's the only thing I use, and I have uh, good passwords on all my accounts, and I have a, a router that... Uh, does a reasonably good job of uh, keeping out uh, people who try to uh, come into my system. And that and it's really just setting up the defaults. It's just a good quality one. I don't worry. 
I mean, if, if there's a security hole in Microsoft Paint, God bless them. Let them steal all the colors they want from Microsoft Paint. I'll send them to them. I'll save them the trouble. It's not the paint. It's the .NET. And what they can do is they can lift any personal or financial information you may have stored. Right. And things like that. If you, if you download questionable software, you know, www.hotmartianbabes.com, it comes with lots of, lots, of, lots of malware on it. And if you choose to download that, then God bless you. You know, you're, you're opening yourself up to lots of problems. If you're careful about what you do, and, and we've talked about this a million times in this group, if you're careful about what you do, 99% of the time, you're not going to have a problem. It's when you, you know, do something silly. And if you do something silly, if you think you have a problem, you know, malware bytes and adware and all these other tools do a very good job of scanning your system to see what's going on. And in a real emergency, if you think something's really bad, turn your machine off, unplug it, pull it out, turn it off, disconnect it from the internet, and, and uh, do the stuff in standalone and make sure you have a clean machine before you connect to the internet again. You know, that, but, but that's, uh, that's all uh, basic stuff to do. But that's after the, you know, that's closing the door after the cow's out of the barn. Yeah, well, I, like, I, I find what you're saying strong, at, um, strong support for taking your software from Apple through the App Store. Uh, Absolutely. It's a closed system. And, and, and good, better, and different. Apple does a good job in, in making sure that the software is, is good. Every now and then, something happens and they've admitted it maybe too late, but they've admitted it. But most of the time the app store is safe. I can't say the same about Microsoft store. I don't know enough. And I, and I can say, I can't say I've never taken anything from them, but I can't remember anything that I have taken from them. I, like I say, there are some features that have moved into the Microsoft app store and uh, my graphics control is now a store app. My uh, sound control might, one day be a store app. Uh, things of that nature, uh, Microsoft is moving them. Uh, as for Microsoft store apps, they've generally had at least as good a track record of not having problems as the Apple store. Better than Google Play. Fair enough. I, I can't speak to it. You know, and, and I don't, I, you know, if you have a custom machine where you have custom, custom uh, Features. If you replace the uh, the video processor in your in your desktop, if you replace the uh, the sound processor in your desktop, and things like that, and have have all sorts of things, uh, then going to the vendors is the best place to go. If not, my personal recommendation, and, and I would tell anybody, is go to go to your vendor. I have a Dell machine. If I'm looking for a driver or something, I go to the Dell machine. I type in my service code or, or identify my machine, and look for updates that. Uh, that need to be applied if they're not automatically applied. And I make a suggestion. They'll tell me that I need a new video driver. I download the video driver because it's coming from Dell. It's associated with the specific hardware that was delivered to me from them. And it's been tested on that machine. Otherwise, you leave it. If I go to, uh, I, I happen to have a Dell monitor, but if I go to uh, an HP monitor or, an, or, 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 a, or somebody else's monitor, you know, I can download this, uh, a new driver for it but it may or may not be compatible and may break something. You know, that's just two sides of the same coin. I'm yeah, just... Again, with drivers, if, it, if it's working, you don't want to replace it. Yep, yep. And software is, is similar. It's, you know, if your software works, let it work. Just, be, just because it was, you know, invented for the abacus doesn't mean it doesn't provide the useful function. That's generally true, unless there's a full version upgrade or you're several versions behind, in which case you may begin to lose the ability to use some of the features. Right. And it, so, so if you need some of the features that come out in the new upgrade, then that's a reason to, uh, to in fact, upgrade. If you don't need the reason, there's no reason to, there's no reason to upgrade. I mean, for example, I was running, uh, micro, before I went to LibreOffice, which I use now, I was running Microsoft Office 2010. For like forever. Yeah. There's no reason for me to go to newer versions. None at all. You know, they all work. With Office, as long as it's still being patched 
and there don't turn out to be compatibility issues with the operating system updates, uh, and there aren't any security related patches, you can stick with the old one as long as it's supported. Yeah, and, and now everything is Office 365 where they, you know, for $8 a month, you can enjoy the world or whatever they charge you. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm off my soapbox. Continue. <laughs> no, Peter, you do have some good points there. Well, if I comb my hair right, they don't show. <laughs> okay, uh, gentlemen um, and people, when, women, uh, gentle humans, I have a couple other topics I'd like to uh, bring up. Uh, as promised. What you see is nine night right now, but what I want to point out is um, um, many years ago I uh, stumbled across a program called Radio Tracker and uh, this is a version that you can get and what this lets you do is it lets you listen to internet radio stations and we're talking about thousands of them. It lets you, when you buy a paid version, record uh, more than 25 cuts from them. And the reason I went to the screen is because I just wanted to show you my uh, a, um, my uh, iTunes. And you can see I have uh, over 4,000 songs here. Uh, these are all legally obtained. These were all obtained by using Radio Tracker or its uh, replacement uh, AU dials. Um, a, I don't know how to pronounce it. And I'm able to download these and uh, play them, which is extremely nice. Uh, I happen to like the uh, new age music, which lets me do my work uh, while I'm listening to music. And um, here's a radio tracker version you can get, which is the predecessor to AU dials. And here is um, uh, all dials that you can get it, uh, record MP3s. You can also record TV shows. So, Wait a second, slow, slow down a second, Steve. Sure enough. Uh, you put up too many names of too many products too quickly. So okay. are these oh. multiple products that one would want, or is there one that one goes to? There, there are two products here that I'm discussing here. Uh, whoops. The first one is, uh, it's, it's still the same company. That's why it's a little confusing. Uh, it's called Radio Tracker. This is a simple little program. Um, radiotracker.en.softtonic.com. This is a simple uh, program that lets you re find and record uh, audio. Uh, it music. says it's for Windows. It is for Windows. There is not a Macintosh version. Okay. For those of you who have Macintosh, you'll have to do what I've done. I have a virtual machine sitting on a Linux machine over here, and it's running. AU dials, I can share that one as well. But nonetheless, you can see a version and information. Radio Tracker, uh, I've seen it for as low as $20. You can get a free version and it lets you download 25 songs to give it a tryout. And then, as you can see, I can download over 4,000 songs and I just gave up. because. Have you compared this with Spotify? No, I can't. Uh, I don't know how Spotify works. Does that let you save music to your device? Yes, it does. And uh, the difference between the free one and the paid one is the paid one keeps on throwing up uh, ads. But as long as that doesn't irritate you too much, actually, you know, I'm, I'm not, I believe it allows you to save things, but it also allows you to listen to all kinds of things. Okay. Well, I can't, I haven't done a comparison because I haven't used Spotify but I can tell you that the way this one works is I have downloaded these songs. Actually, the, these songs that I showed you when I was here were ones that I downloaded on a Windows Vista machine, then a Windows 7, uh, then a Windows 8, Windows uh, 10. I've downloaded them. Uh, they're all in a, a directory. I've loaded that here into my system, uh, my Mac. It's on my iPhones. It's on three iPhones that I have so that I can listen to the music from one of the iPhones, um, it's, an I'm, uh, it's an iPod Touch when I'm in the car. So it lets me port around the songs quite well. And it doesn't have to be just new age. Um, I had a friend who wanted to get some uh, Indian music for an event. So I set it up to record music uh, of the Indian music, you know, like India uh, genre. And I set it up one night and the next morning there's 150 songs that it's downloaded. Uh, uh, my wife likes opera. Uh, so other people like opera. I noticed John pick up on that one. 
she wanted some opera songs. So I set the thing up to record opera overnight. They're not opera songs, opera. they're opera arias. Okay, I got some arias, uh, some solos and various pieces. She's got all of uh, Carmen. She plays it. In fact, uh, we get an alert every Thursday night to take the trash out because it comes, uh, some guy comes out and starts singing an aria. So I hear this aria going. And even if I'm walking down the street and I hear the aria, I start looking for trash cans. Another program. Um, Thank you, Dr. That, Pavlov. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> the, um, another one is uh, AU Dials. That's a more recent one. And when you take a look at AUDIALS.com, you see that they have our AU Dials 1. I believe it's $40 if you pay retail. Look around, you might be able to get it at a lower price. But what it gives you for more information um, here, it lets you, uh, you can download by upgrade. But it's music, radio, movies, TV, and I guess apps. I haven't used it too much. I've used it mostly for uh, music, but you can also download songs from other, uh, other sites uh, or places. Um, there's also another program I wanted to show you. And that's this one right here. This is called, whoops, there we go. Uh, this is... Um, you can see it up in the corner, any video converter ultimate. Now, how is this useful? Well, you can uh, download, uh, there's no, there's the history. I've downloaded a number of uh, videos from YouTube, okay? Uh, there are some of us here who will download these. I have uh, some videos I can play for you this morning, but I've downloaded them by, uh, from YouTube. And what I do is I find the URL to download it and it automatically downloads it for you which is quite nice. This does cost money, and it not only will download music from YouTube and other sites, it can also com uh, convert them uh, from one format to another. If you uh, don't want MP4, if you want a M M a VMW or VMV, WMV, if you want a different format, it can do that if you just want to extract the music out. There's a, a, pro a free program called 4K Video Downloader which will take the URL from YouTube and download it to a uh, form on your, on your PC. It is a free utility and I've used it successfully without uh, any side effects that I know of.